Oh, so this is um, African American history documentary um, that I found for Black History Month. Um, thanks for watching. In 1619, Virginia was a sparsely populated island which was struggling to make the colony profitable for human. But the colonists were devastated by disease, death, and Native American attacks. So when a badly damaged Dutch ship arrived on their island, carrying 20 kidnapped Africans, the colony offered food and services to the Dutchman in exchange for the human cargo. The colonists had no model for human slavery, so the Africans joined the Europeans to serve them in their fields. In exchange for seven years of hard labor, they would be earning land and food. The colonies prospered and their exports grew more profitable. The colonies were more reluctant to lose their labor. Africans here were not subject to English common law, but they were workers without rights. In 1641, when slavery was legalized, situations became worse and the law said that Africans became personal property and could be owner for life. Slavery became so profitable in the colonies that in 1660, King Charles II established a company named the Royal African Company to import Africans for slavery. They were referred to as black gold who were imported from Africa to America. America relied on its own internal slave trade when the British outlawed slavery in 1807. By 1860, they were more than one million slaves being moved and sold within the colonies. The traders marched as slaves from the east coast to the southern plantations. On the way, the slaves were treated like animals and hurdled in warehouses and yards. The traders wanted a self-reproducing labor force, and the labels they used reflected the degradation of slavery. They were sold in the auction where women were further sold into prostitution or as mistresses to their masters. The enslaved population was controlled by legal authorized violence, whippings, and public beatings. But slavery always had its critics in America. As the slave trade grew, so did the opposition, and eventually, America became a country divided against itself. The Black Population Within 100 years, around 25,000 black slaves occupied the colonies of North America, constituting about 10% of the total population. Most of the slaves were directly brought from Africa, while some of them were brought from the West Indies, who had already been working in the island for some time, and many of them were born in North America. Laws had defined their status clearly. They were slaves till they died and the children of the female slaves were also bound to their masters. They could be freely sold or given freedom and many tried to run away using the underground railway. For the owners, they were merely herds of animals. The number of slaves that were imported from Africa was highest between 1660 and 1700 when more and more white settlers cleared land for agriculture and plantations. The demand for slaves from West Indies reduced as they were more expensive, hard to get, or their strengths were destroyed because of the hardships from working on the sugar plantations. In the end of 17th century, the British removed many taxes and royal monopolies from America which made it easier for America to trade for slaves. Healthier and physically stronger African slaves were now available at cheaper prices. For the next 150 years, between the 1700 to 1859, most of the slaves brought to North America came straight from Africa in massive shipments to fulfill the needs of the required labor as the Americans were expanding their farms and plantations in the South and were heading their way to South Carolina, Virginia, and Spanish Louisiana or French. The northern colonies were much more developed, residential and industrialized communities and they were more dependent on economy rather than farming. 
Hence, they did not buy or import any slaves from Africa. There was a very small group of black who occupied that area and it remained the same for a long time. But the bigger cities like Boston, New York, and Philadelphia had huge colonies of black population. Some were free and some were slaves. They continued to occupy these cities during the time of colonies as well as after America gained its freedom. During 1750s, there were more American-born slaves of African origin than African-born slaves. When the period for the American Revolution was near, slavery also became less and most of the states in North stopped and forbid slavery. The states of the South, like Virginia, however, had so many locally born, self-sustaining slaves that they did not require to import any slaves from Africa. They continued to have slaves though. South Carolina and Georgia in the South continued to import slaves for many more years till 1808. A few states imported so many black slaves that the blacks outnumbered the white people by 3 to 1 in South Carolina, whereas although Virginia had many slaves, the whites continued to dominate the population. By the 18th century, South Carolina looked much more like extended colony of West Africa than of British. In 1808, slave importing had stopped and the new American laws prohibited Americans from partaking in slavery completely. Yet till late 1859, there were many ships which illegally shipped slaves from Africa. Gradually, the free blacks started to occupy cities beside the Atlantic coast from Charleston to Boston. Most of the slaves lived towards the south in the rice and tobacco plantations. They were cluttered into groups of 20 and more in one room, while the slaves who lived in the towns and cities were better advantaged than them. The rich plantation holders had become dependent on the slaves that they deprived their own lower class of people by not employing or giving them work. Within a few years' association, slavery had become so deeply involved in the southern economy that it later on divided America into two. The utmost dead slave insurgents was the Stono Uprising in South Carolina of September 1739. There were around 56,000 slaves in the colony who outstripped the white population two is to one. Over 150 slaves raised their voices against the whites. They seized ammunition and guns and killed 21 whites and moved towards Spanish Florida. The local soldiers, however, seized and killed most of the rebels. The imbalance in the statistical distribution of slaves in the North and South was one of the reasons which led to freedom of the blacks. The northern part of America only had about 2% of blacks as slaves who were personal servants, whereas there were 25% of slaves who worked in the plantations in the southern parts of America. The Revolution in Early America The second half of the 18th century was a time of unrest for the people of the United States. In the middle of calls for a spite from British rule, people pointed out the ostensible pretenses of slave owners who demanded independence. The Declaration of Independence was to become a platform for hominid privileges and individual independence was written by Thomas Jefferson, who held over 200 slaves in captivity. There were other statesmen who enslaved many blacks as well. The Second Continental Congress did contemplate liberating slaves to interrupt British trade. They removed dialectal from the Declaration of Independence, which comprised the preferment of captivity among the felonies of King George III. There were many blacks who wrote petitions to end the slavery. One such black, Prince Hall, who was also the founder of Prince Hall Freemasonry, had given many petitions which the administration failed to recognize. This, however, did not discourage the blacks and many other free slaves from partaking in the American Revolution. One of the first free black who fought on behalf of the Americans and to be killed at the Boston Massacre was Crispus Attucks. Prince Hall and 5,000 other blacks 
fought with the Americans in their war for freedom against the British in the Continental Army at the battles of Concord, Lexington, and Bunker Hill. They fought to impress their white neighbors and for their own freedom. More than 25,000 slaves fled to join and fight with the British and many escaped in the chaos of the war. George Washington, however, did not employ any blacks once he took command in 1775. Once the war was over, the Americans demanded back what was theirs. However, the British aided 4,000 African Americans to leave the country and select to go to Britain, Jamaica, and Nova Scotia instead of going back to slavery. It took more than 20 years after the American Revolution for the blacks to fight their own freedom. Many socialists raised their voices to help the slaves gain their freedom. Moravians and Quakers were two such people who convinced the slaveholders to release the enslaved families. Religion The blacks started going to churches by the 1800. The northern blacks had set up many churches and in the south, they sat in the upper gallery. The main progress in the community was the establishment of a black church. In fact, it was the first communal institute to be set up. The black church was manifestation of togetherness and unique African-American devoteness in response to discernment. The church was also a center for all the blacks in the neighborhood who could celebrate their African traditions without the interruption of white critics. The church was also the place where there was education. As the church was a segment of the society and sought to educate the people, they also helped in the freeing of the blacks who were still kept in captivity. Since the church was part of the community and wanted to provide education, they educated the freed and enslaved blacks. Looking for independence, certain blacks like Bishop Richard Allen started distinct black denominations. The Antebellum Period In 1780, Pennsylvania became the first to take step towards the abolishment of slavery. Many events took place and one such event was Haitian Revolution, which was a revolt so strong that it led to a free state of Haiti. Slave owners ran to United States to save their lives from the massacre that happened in the South. With the creation of cotton gene in 1790, cotton could be cultivated deep in the south where the weather was suitable and the ground was fertile. The Industrial Revolution in England and Europe created large requirements for cotton and economical clothes which lead to a heavy demand for slaves to work in the cotton plantations. Within years, the demand rose to 70% and slaves were devastatingly focused in working on the plantations in the south and slowly moved the west, and once the old field of cotton became infertile, they purchased new fields. On the request of President Thomas Jefferson, international slave trade was abolished by the Congress in 1807. The American blacks rejoiced the moment of their victory against the slavery and prohibition on demand for slaves. The Upper South was undergoing changes in their ways of agriculture, and they were no longer having tobacco plantations, instead moved to mixed farming which did not require much slaves. These slaves were sold to the buyers in the South who were developing cotton plantations. According to Fugitive Slave Act of 1793, all the blacks were considered runaways unless a white affirmed on their behalf. Many free blacks and children were abducted and sold as slaves without any hopes of them being rescued. In 1819, there were 11 slave states and 11 free states that augmented sectionalism. The Congress feared the inequity and which is why there was the Missouri Compromise in 1820 which stated that all the states would be admitted in the Union in pairs of one free and one slave. Abolitionism Following the example of a Swedish monarch, King Charles I had passed a law in 1542 which could have abolished slavery in the colonies, 
since it was not passed in all the colonies, it was not enforced. Later, in the 18th century, the Catholic Church took up the plea of Lorenco da Silva de Mendoca, formally convicted the slave trade, which was confirmed fervently by Pope Gregory XVI in 1839. An abolitionist effort only began in the late 18th century when American and English Quakers began to query the ethics of captivity. There were many campaigns in United States and Britain from 1840 to 1860 against slavery. According to Stamp, though abolitionists never argued that the physical treatment of slaves had any decisive bearing on the issue of the morality of slavery, their propaganda emphasized cruelties and atrocities for the purpose of winning converts. According to Blight, the authenticity of these reports about Southern atrocity is questionable. I know of no verification for them. The propaganda uses of such stories, though, were not lost on abolitionist editors such as Douglas. Canicott debates the effectiveness of the black abolitionist who spoke in front of many local gatherings of the National Negro Conventions. Their arguments were based on slavery, opposing it on ethical, fiscal, and administrative grounds. Their participation in the campaigns were not only helpful in the abolitionist movement, but also was a proud moment for the community of the blacks. A book, Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe, published in 1852, changed the views of people of North about what they thought of slavery. The story was about a slave and brutalities faced by him in his daily life. It sold 100,000 copies in the first year that it published. Stowe was later invited to White House by Abraham Lincoln, the black community. There were more than 319,000 free blacks who roamed the cities of United States of America by 1830. Around half of them resided in the northern states. The blacks who settled in the cities tried to establish churches and communal orders which failed earlier but were the first steps to the fruition of their community. The early periods of antebellum created the black communities which expanded to lay the foundations of the future of the African American. They tried to make homes and get jobs for themselves in the cities, and in the early 1800s, many blacks moved to the urban areas in search of jobs. There were many jobs which they could have done, but the owners of the industries denied employing black workers. They preferred the whites as they thought of them to be more educated and trustworthy. The blacks had to be satisfied with lesser paying and unskilled jobs like construction workers, grave and well diggers, stevedores, etc. The black women worked as domestic help for the white families. Many were teachers, nurses, seamstresses, cooks, midwives, washerwomen, and basket makers. Many cities had individual cooks, confectioners, seamstresses and basket makers, and many other professionalists. There were many African Americans who prioritized in reuniting with their friends and families rather than having free lives. Revolutionary war and poverty made it difficult for them to make houses and forced them to move west. While some of the blacks struggled in poverty, many were able to progress in businesses which was provided to the black community. Discrimination meant that the blacks were not allowed in white businesses or would be ill-treated there. Blacks like James Fortin made their own communities that were owned by the blacks like lawyers, doctors, or other businessmen, which laid the foundations of middle-class black society. Founded in 1830, the American Society of Free Persons of Color and Black Church helped the blacks to fight political problems united. After the establishment of black church in North, the free blacks established black churches in the South also. The free blacks in Virginia created many communities in Virginia and Richmond where they could work as artists and make their own business while the others could own lands and farm in the frontier areas 
which was far from the control of the whites. Since the black were restricted from going to public schools, the black communities organized school for their children. The first school was established in Philadelphia in 1795 by Richard Allen. Five years later, a priest named Absalom Jones started a school for the youth of the black communities. The African Americans regarded education was the way to economic success, happiness, and self-improvement. Only the children of black middle class could study in this school. Haiti's Effect The Ten-Year Revolt of the Haitian Slaves from 1791 to 1801 fuel the abolitionists and the slaves for their freedom in the United States of America. An edition of Niles Weekly Register is stated that blacks in Haiti were in a better condition than the slaves in Jamaica, and many other positive things have been referred to in the paper American Emancipation. These opinions were famous with both the African-American slaves and the abolitionists. Slaves assembled about these thoughts with revolts against their controllers, as well as innocent white onlookers during the Nat Turner Rebellion of 1831 and the Denmark Vesey Conspiracy of 1822. Traders and plantation owners were also highly worried about the magnitudes that Haiti's rebellion would have on early America for diverse motives. American Civil War Emancipation the biggest turn in the African-American history was when President Abraham Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation on January 1, 1863, which legally declared all the slaves in the Confederate areas free. When the plantation owners learned that the emancipation would put an end to their flourishing trade, they moved their slaves far where the Union Army couldn't locate them. However, by 1865 of June, the Union Army had in control the entire Confederacy and had freed all the slaves. Around 200,000 free blacks and earlier slaves were now in the Union Navy and the Army, which gave them the rights to complete citizenship. The wars left most of the black population dislocated, as many of them died with diseases and sickness. Reconstruction the 1866 Civil Rights Act made all the blacks citizens of the U.S. In 1868, a 14th Amendment allowed rights of a full U.S. citizenship to the African Americans. An approved 15th Amendment of the 1870 gave the black males the right to vote. The Freedmen's Bureau was a U.S. federal government agency created in 1865 to help the freed slaves in the South through the restoration period of the United States, which endeavored to alter the society in the previous Confederacy. When the Union won over the Confederacy, there was a time of Southern Black development known as Reconstruction which followed. The position of the South changed completely as the states which were left out were being reconsidered into the Union. Many men from the South started voting and were elected for the post of sheriff and United States Congress. Alliances of black and white Republicans approved the bills to start the first public school systems in most of the states in South, though adequate finance was hard to get. Blacks made their own towns, churches, and businesses. Thousands traveled to Mississippi to try their luck and own land for themselves, as most of the land was not developed. By the end of the 19th century, Two-thirds of the agriculturalists who possessed plots in the Mississippi Delta bottomlands were black. In 1870, Hiram Revels was the first African American to become senator in the U.S. Congress. Other African Americans soon followed and there were blacks in Congress from Alabama, South Carolina, Mississippi, and Georgia. The new representatives sustained the Republicans and strained to bring additional developments in the lives of African Americans. Revels and the others agreed that whites might have felt vulnerable by the African American congressmen. Revels stated, The white race has no better friend than I. I am true to my own race. I wish to see all done that can be done. 
to assist in acquiring property and becoming intelligent, enlightened citizens, but at the same time, I would not have anything done which would harm the white race. Many activists disagreed to the fact that the process of identity formation of the African American was accelerated, as even though the slaves were declared free, there were many rules and regulations which refrained them from living in equality with the whites. Therefore, thousands of blacks left their homes in the north and moved to the south, where they print newspapers, build schools, and opened small businesses. Many women and men joined as teachers who were sponsored by many societies and many came as religious missionaries too. Hundreds of soldiers also came back once the war was over. Jim Crow, Disfranchisement and Challenges From 1876 and 1965, there were local and state laws of Jim Crow which enacted in the United States. They instructed the jury separation in all civic amenities with an allegedly separate but equal position for the black Americans. In authenticity, this action and adjustments were frequently mediocre to those made for white Americans, classifying many financial, learning, and communal drawbacks. If the look of years of rising ferocity and terrorization engaged at blacks, as well as whites compassionate to their cause, the U.S. administration recalled from its initiate to assure legitimate securities to the freed women and men. Because of national compromise when the elections were happening in 1877, President Rutherford B. Hayes had withdrawn the Union troops from the southern parts. The autonomous southerners lost no time in their attempts of reversing the revolutionary advances of the Reconstruction. To decrease black voting and recuperate control of state governments, Republicans had used a mixture of vehemence, deception, and pressure since the voting of 1868. These methods were protuberant among soldier groups such as the Red Shirts and White League in Florida, Louisiana, and Mississippi before the elections of 1876. In South Carolina, for example, a historian projected 150 black deaths in the weeks prior to the election. Annihilation happened at Ellington and Hamburg. White paramilitary vehemence against African Americans is strengthened. Many blacks were afraid of this, and men like Benjamin Papp Singleton started talking about the breaking away from the South. This, though, ended in the 1879 to 1880 drive of the Exodusters who moved to Kansas. White Republicans first approved rules to make voter registration and elections more difficult. Most of the instructions operated devastatingly in contradiction of blacks, but several poor whites were also disfranchised. Multiracial alliances of populists and Republicans in many states succeeded in controlling governments in the 1880s and 1894, which made the populists more resolute to lessen voting by poorer classes. When Democrats seized control of Tennessee in 1888, they approved the rules creating complex voter registration procedures and finished the most reasonable political state in the South. Voting by blacks in country areas and minor townships went down increasingly and so did the voting by poor white Americans. Beginning with Mississippi and concluding with Georgia from 1890 to 1908, from the 11 southern states, 10 of them accepted new alterations which efficiently disfranchised or took away the voting rights, most poor whites and blacks. A mix of literacy tests and poll taxes were cleverly used for the voters' registration, which automatically reduced the black voting crowd and in some places, it was zero. As a result, in the South, power was concentrated under one Democratic Party. The party centered as a private club and held elections where only whites could vote, shutting the blacks completely. Though African Americans immediately began lawsuits to encounter such situations, early court judgments at the national and state level went in contradiction of them. The whites wanted to return the blacks to their slavery and passed new laws to isolate society along racial lines. They cut their access to schools, restaurants, 
transportation, and many other civic amenities. The whites promoted the thought that blacks participating in the government were stopped because they were incompetent. Even though bondage had been eliminated, most southern blacks continued to struggle in crushing scarcity as agrarian, home, and unskilled workers for many years. Numerous became sharecroppers, their financial position altered somewhat by liberation. Racial Terrorism A clandestine society by the name Ku Klux Klan aimed on destroying the Republican Party in the South in 1865. They terrorized the black leaders by destroying their property, threatening them with murder, and even murdering them. They hid their identities by wearing disguises and masks. Their terror rose, and with the help of federal supports, the Klansmen and the society was destroyed in 1871. The society was silent for some time as there was violence again after the dispute of Louisiana state elections in 1872 which led to Coushatta and Colfax massacres in 1873 and 1874. Estranges and gossips were in height in many fragments of the South. The rate of African American killed was much higher than European Americans. During the mid-1870s, paramilitary associations rose in the South as the white Democrats struggled a sturdier insurrection, were more absorbed and actual than the Klan in stimulating Republican governments, overpowering the black vote, and attaining political goals. Jim Crow was the cruelest upsurge among all the racial suppressions that America went through. The brutalism continued till 1940 when millions of African Americans were murdered, disfranchised, and tortured. According to records maintained in Tuskegee Institute, around 5,000 women, children, and men were assassinated in mob violence known as lynchings. However, according to journalist Ida B. Wells, the killings were around 20,000 as there were many lynchings which were not reported. There were less than 50 whites among the thousands of lynchers and spectators who were accused and just four were condemned. Since the blacks were disfranchised, they were unable to participate in any political processes, local offices, or sit in juries. The blacks did not have the rights to keep arms under the Jim Crow laws, which made them vulnerable to the attacks of the lynchings. They continued to live in a state of terror and fretfulness. Civil Rights in order to take action against these suppressings, 28 well-known African American, along with W.E.B. Du Bois, secretly met in Ontario at Niagara Falls. There, they shaped a strategy calling for an end to racial discrimination, full public freedoms for African Americans, and acknowledgement of hominid comradeship. This meeting which happened was known as the Niagara Movement. In 1908, after the infamous Springfield, Illinois racial unrest, and in 1909, many whites joined this movement and shaped the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, or NAACP. The NAACP used the law court arrangement to encourage parity at the native-level African Americans accepted a do-it-yourself approach. They joined their capitals to generate self-governing community and official lives for themselves. They built banks, schools, welfare institutions, small businesses, churches, African-American newspapers to attend the wants of their societies. The chief manager of local self-help and national organizations was an educator from Alabama, Booker T. Washington. Broad-minded campaigners were frequently worried with the condition of the blacks. Ray Stannard Banker was the first journalist to scrutinize America's racial division in his book, Following the Color Line, an account of Negro citizenship in the American democracy. The Great Migration and Harlem Renaissance Over 5 million African Americans in 1910 moved to the West, Northern cities, and Midwest in order to get jobs, educate their children, escape political abhorrence and discernment, and to enjoy a rightful better life. New York saw many blacks who settled in masses, 
they witness a cultural movement known as the Harlem Renaissance in the 1920s. There were many writers like Nella Larson, Richard Wright, Langston Hughes, Claude McKay, and Zora Neale were some of the writers who became famous during this era. Other artists who flourished with their works were Akebald Motley, Louis Maley Jones, William H. Johnson, and Jacob Lawrence. There were many theorists who embraced negritude or blackness. The south part of Chicago was a place for many trains for Arkansas, Louisiana, and Mississippi, which was declared the black capital of America, with many prosperous businesses, food, music, and art. There was a complete new group of strong African-American politicians and association who came up. The NAACP gained strong and powerful members who always had anti-lynching campaigns and fought for the blacks. Business Africans were forcibly brought to America for work, so when later they started getting their freedom, they started their own small businesses as small traders and hawkers. Some of the blacks started work even while they were working under tradesmen as slaves. The civil rights and emancipation permitted the businessmen to operate within America legally, and many small businesses grew speedily. Jim Crow system fueled this movement more, and there were big communities of black which established business. There were thousands of small businesses which flourished by 1920 and most of them being insurance companies. The black communities faced a major setback in the Great Depression of 1929 to 1939. Most of the businesses closed down and many became unemployed. There were many federal programs later in the 1970s which helped in promoting smaller business activities and helped them financially. World War I During the World War I, the forces of the United States remained separate. There were many African Americans who enrolled for the war. By November of 1918, more than 350,000 African Americans had worked on the Western Front with American forces. Most of the units were in lower roles and did not come face to face with war. Still, they played a small role in the efforts of America's war. Later, Four of the African-American units were merged with the French units as three years of the long war left the French army torn apart and in need of men. 369th Infantry Regiment was one of the distinguished units who fought bravely in the front lines for around six months. They were also known as the Harlem Hell Fighters. 171 members of the regiment were awarded the Legion of Merit. Corporate Freddy Stowers of the 371st Infantry Regiment was the only African American to be honored with the Medal of Honor 73 years after his death. New Deal There were many relief agencies started specially for the blacks which made sure that they actually helped them. Associations like FERA, WPA, and CCC did much for the locals and hosted many relief programs. The WPA employed over 2 million laborers and all the races were given the same wages and did not have any differentiation in the working conditions. Harold X, who was civil rights activist headed a federal agency by the name of Public Works Administration which set reservations for private companies who hired unskilled and skilled black labor in various construction projects through them. The effect was that the black who never got a chance to vote were now in favorable position and they grabbed this opportunity to work with the new federal organizations as administrators and social workers. Activists necessitated a federal anti-lynching bill, but President Roosevelt knew it would never pass Congress, rather would riven his New Deal coalition. Second Great Migration More than 5 million African Americans of South migrated to other parts of the United States of America, which included Oakland, California, and Los Angeles. This was the Second Great Migration which began in 1941 and lasted till 1970. There were many skilled jobs available as now the blacks were better educated and skilled. 
By the time Second Great Migration came to an end, the African American had become a developed population and with more than 80% living in cities. Many remained in the South, while some of them were living in the North Central States, Northeast, and West. Civil Rights Movement Many civil rights groups like Southern Christian Leadership Conference or SELC held across the South with strategies like boycotts, freedom rides, voter registration camps, and many peaceful actions like pickets, sit-ins, and marches on problems on voting rights and equal amenities. The Southern whites fought back but the law enforcers replied back with fire horses, attack dogs, batons, mass arrests, and electric cattle prods. The highest point of the civil rights movement was the march in Washington for Jobs and Freedom in 1963, for which more than 250,000 gathered on the grounds of National Mall and Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. to speak against the continued racial violence and police brutality in the South, equal access in public accommodations and education, equality in employment. The main organizers of the march were known as Big Six of the Civil Rights Movement, Baynard Rustin, James Farmer, Roy Watkins, Whitney Young Jr., John Lewis, and Martin Luther King Jr. An active member behind the scenes was the head of National Council of Negro Women Dorothy Height. It was during this memorable event that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. gave his historic speech of I Have a Dream on the Steps of Lincoln Memorial. The Birmingham's Children's Crusade of 1963 and this march with many other events pressurized the presidents John F. Kennedy and Lyndon B. Johnson that concluded in the passage the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which forbid discernment in employment, public accommodations, and labor unions. Frugally and administratively, the blacks in America have made many considerable treads in the history of African American. The financial development for blacks accomplishing the extravagances of prosperity has been sluggish. As per the Forbes richest lists, Oprah Winfrey was the richest African American of the 20th century and the world's only black billionaire in 2004, 2005, and 2006. Oprah is not only the black billionaire of the world, but she has also been on the list of Forbes 400 since 1995. The founder of BED Bob Johnson joined her later on in the list in 2001, 2002, and 2003, after which his ex-wife got some part of his wealth. However, he returned to the list in 2006 but could not make it to the list in the following year. The histrionic step forward was in the 2008 elections when Barack Obama was voted the President of the United States of America. Even with Hillary Clinton as his opponent, Obama won with huge numbers. Obama won the hearts of many as after the completion of his term, he won the 2012 elections once again to be re-elected as the President of America once again. He stood against Mitt Romney this time. While the long struggle lasted for years and many gave their lives to attain this freedom, the African American now enjoy equal rights and have a peaceful life of equality and brotherhood in the United States of America.